Now this squiggly line graph is probably the most important graph of the whole talk. And it also gets a bit complicated. But this is where we divided up, well we looked at the farm um, financials in terms of inputs. So that's your everyday normal inputs which are primarily, or most of the inputs would be in fertilizers and, and herbicides and fungicides. But we also looked at farm machinery, finance costs and the labour costs. So this is the input, the squiggly line here, which was around, and I've divided up into a percentage contribution of total costs. Okay. Now what we generally would like to see on the farm is that the inputs are around 35% of the total expenditure on the farm. Now that's what we would regard as farm consultants as being quite a healthy range. Now a Mallee farm with very high inputs that is in total no-till are way above 50%. Which means that you know, you're putting a lot of eggs up in front just in terms of herbicides and fertilizers for a very risky return. Now on this particular farm it was for a long time around the 30-35% and started dropping back. We'll talk about that in a minute. The machinery costs have gone up but the one that has gone up the most are the financial costs. So this particular farm is now spending 30% of their total costs on servicing their debt. Now, as farmers, or as any business would know, that is completely unsustainable. So that's partly related to the purchase of land, but also partly related to the very, very long runs of, or long run of very, very poor years. And the way that he's, they've been able to compensate for that is by labour. So the labour used to be about 20% of total expenditure and it's down, down below 10% at the moment. So this particular farm, the people who work on there are actually working much longer hours and working much harder with f fewer labour units compared to what they used to do. And that is partly are compensated. Are they getting any younger? Huh? No, they're not getting any younger. <laughs> So, well, I mean, what, what I'm asking there is, well, the son has come home had, on the farm. Have they had young, young labour units that were on the farm that are no longer there, or what, what, what's happened to them? Well, there were older labour units on the farm, and there's only one older labour unit left on the farm, and there's a younger farmer on the farm now. And that younger farmer is really compensated by working much harder, and they didn't have any other labour on the farm for a long time. Is that taking an emotional and physical toll? I'm sure it is. Mm. But this is quite reflective of a lot of farms in the region too. Because, I mean, something has got to give. And, and this year was meant to be the year when a lot of debt could, could have been repaid, but it didn't happen this year. So generally when we look at the overall components of input of the total cost, we're looking at 35% in inputs, 35% of machinery, Labor 15 to 20 percent, and finance generally 15 to 20 percent. Have you got a, a graph of the total of all those sort of inputs together, so that I mean, the financial costs have gone up a lot, but his labor costs have come down, and they sort of cancelling each other out and things like that. So, yes. are his input total inputs, which including all of those things, getting more or less? Okay, so the red bars. Yes. I mean, I know that 10% of the men in this audience are colour blind, but yes. the red ones are the solid lines, and that's why I tried to hatch some of them, but you can't see them properly. But the second bar, anyway, is the, um, the farm cost, so that's the total costs, and you can see that it was hovering around that between the 150 and 200 for a long time, and now it's increased a bit. Yeah? So. What you're saying in one area hasn't offset the cost in another, that's what no, so but actually the cost have increased, but the cost have increased on every single farm that, that we've ever worked on over that time. And you can't avoid that really. Are you uh, allocating costs to the manager of the operation for labour? Yes, but only as in terms of a, for the amount of hours that they work, so we've got an agreement with the farms, with the farmers on how many hours you're working and we're allocating a salary according to the hours that they're working. What sort of so it's not actually drawings. So drawings, total drawings would come out as an additional cost to what we've got in here. So, you know, if they've got three kids at private school or three kids at the local high school would be very different in terms of drawings from the farm. So you can't look at this as a cash flow analysis. 
course, cash flow analysis, you really take into account the real drawings from the farm. David, you've done this. Can you remember? It's not actually David's farm. Sorry, I have to make that clear. But <coughs> yeah, no, sorry, I'll have to have to check that. Yeah, it is nowhere near enough. I mean, uh, and we appreciate that. But if you, we find that there are actually a lot of farmers who are working at for less than that, much less than that. Sorry, so Andrew. It's just a standardised figure you've used across farms. Yeah, to, but it, to it is dependent on the hours. on the amount of hours that they work. Oh, okay. okay. So if there is another half labour unit on the farm, like one of the kids goes to school, but he still does significant amount of work on the weekend, that's included. Okay. But it's not drawings. Now, if you're, as soon as I get in front of a group of economists, there's a huge argument about what should be in, what should be out, and everything else. And you guys are much more relaxed about it than farm economists are. Okay, now this. So what I've done here, so I've worked out some cash margins for crop and and um, livestock. So the crop cash margins are these hatched blue bars, and the sheep or the livestock um, cash margins are the more solid ones. So you can see that on this side, so from 2000 or back, the sheep were a very small component of the total cash margin on the farm, which you expect. But in the last, or in the, since he put in a feedlot, they've increased significantly, especially in those really, really poor year, poor years when the drought was so severe that he was running a lot more livestock now compared to what he was doing then. And that's made a big difference on the cash margin in terms of the risk management. Um, well, he still grows enough grain to feed the sheep, so even in the drought years. Leading to the next question there, if, if he is using your own grain, yeah, that should be in there. the sheep is he in front compared to taking it down and selling it to yeah. a grain buyer? On, for, with the price of sheep at the moment, he's definitely had. What? To what extent has the Wilmer Pipeline uh, distribution network contributed to the uh, reintroduction of livestock into the Wilmer Mallee system? No, not, there's no reintroduction of livestock. There'd be less livestock in the Wilmer Mallee now than there ever was, I would, right. would say. But it's certainly made those farmers who are on it, which is nearly everyone now, much more or less dependent on dams and evaporation and everything else because their water is now secure. So that has an encouragement to be back in the livestock? <coughs> well, the problem is that farmers still had to pay for it from the point of delivery to the rest of the paddock and to all the paddocks on the farm. That was the farm cost to have the, um, the pipe water on, into the paddocks. So. And a lot of farmers already pulled out all the fences, so they're not likely to put sheep back in. And a lot of young farmers don't like sheep. Mm. And they interfere with your cropping system. Yeah. Quite well, they interfere in holidays too. <laughs> so, and, and it is hard work. And actually, David, I don't know, but when you look at all your neighbours, how many of the young farms, and I say young below the age or under, 35 maybe, so not the 40 years old. I mean, they might be young to us, but not really young. How many of them actually run sheep? There's not many. No many of them like to. No, that's right. And if they don't want, if they don't like to, they probably shouldn't. They, they, they don't like to, but there's also a really important thing about running stock that you mentioned before, and that's the labour unit. Yeah. Because stock are much more labour yeah, uh, right. intensive yeah. than running a cropping program where you can run it with maybe two people and an yeah. odd extra labor unit and machinery to oh. take you that way. Livestock, you just can't get away from actually handling them and there are times when you know, you can't contract everything out for livestock yeah. operations. Yeah. So I think that that's also got something to do and with And you have that. to be home on weekends and everything else. So, <laughs> so this is the, um, the farm profit. So that includes all the costs subtracted from the income. And you can see that in this is per hectare. 
and you can do the mathematics yourself. Remember, the farm was about 5,000 hectares or 4,500 hectares at the moment. So there's some very, very good years and then a long run of very, very poor years. And even though this year wasn't the golden year that it was meant to be, it's still going to be a good year. And the average yields on the farm would be somewhere between three and three and a half. And even at feed one or feed two <coughs> prices of $190 a tonne, that is still going to be quite a profitable year, assuming that all the grain can come off over the next three <coughs> or four weeks. <coughs> Plot that against rainfall, and once again, you've got a, a critical 200 millimetres of um, growing season rainfall, below which there is losses made and above which generally is a profit. Now there are exceptions like the 2007 year with quite low rainfall but they did make a profit because of reasonable prices. So price does play a role, it's not just rainfall. Yeah, I will be. Yeah. Okay. So when I looked at the um, cumulative earnings based on EBIT, so that's <coughs> earnings before interest in tax. This is the, the, the Wimra farm. You can see the Wimra farm has made very good earnings over that time period. Even though because of the drought years, the droughts were never that severe, that they really took a hammering in terms of their production systems. And they've made some very good profits. <coughs> the Southern Mallee farm has increased a bit in the beginning, but it's sort of hung in there. This is before interest and tax, remember? And then the, um, the Mallee farm has gone backwards and then had a reasonable year in 2008 when they took opportunity with a very high grain prices. But if you include interest and tax, you see the, the Wimmera farm is a little bit flatter, but both the Mallee and the, and the Southern Mallee farm have actually lost significantly when you look at the total cost of production on the farm. Now, there's a lot of pressure on these farms when the um, equity is getting below 60% and some of these farms it's well below 60%. There's a lot of pressure on the, on the banks as well to maintain the production systems. So in terms of um, risk management, these farms are pretty well managed agronomically. We need a decile three to break even in the, in the Mallee and in, sorry, in the Southern Mallee and in the Mallee and the Wimmera Decile 2 because of the better soil types. Livestock are essential for maintaining a source of income, so that's a risk management strategy, especially in the Southern Mallee with a really problematic <coughs> soils. And 100% crop, as you all know, makes the system very susceptible to risks. Now, just as the last graph, but how many people are familiar with the water use efficiency graph that Reg French and Jeff Schultz developed? <coughs> yeah. So, I mean, what I've tried to do here is take a leaf out of Reg's book and that's, I plotted the farm profit against, so that's EBIT, against the growing season rainfall plus the on-farm <coughs> price of wheat. And so there is an equation and it's exactly, it looks exactly like a water use efficiency curve. And basically what Reg said that 20 kilograms per millimetre per hectare was the production potential for wheat. And we've come up with a profit equation set very similar to Reg's, but it does include the price of wheat. And you can actually go, if you're down here, the argument that Reg used to have is, well, if there's a reason why you're here and not there, is it could be disease or it could be something else. So I'm, at the moment I'm working with these farms and saying, what are the drivers that you happening when you were, were on very close to the line and why are these years actually happening when you're well below the line? Now I've done this with the Southern Mallee farm and it was very clear that because of the very strong negative effect of the soils, on that particular farm, even in years with high rainfall, they couldn't take the opportunity of growing very high yielding crops. And that's one of the reasons they were below the ground.